In March of 2011, a deadly tsunami devastated the coastal towns of northern Japan. But almost a day later, halfway around the world, the waves hit Crescent City, a northern California fishing town crushed by a tsunami in 1964. The resulting damage to the harbor was a major blow for a city already facing hard times. Evacuated the whole town all the way up to 9th Street, and uh, all the sirens are going. And, and I'm watching the first tidal surge that comes in, and I see it surge, and then I see this harbor completely empty. And I mean empty. I mean there wasn't a drop of water in it. So I call them up and I says, "Hey boys, you best hit some high ground. Go find some high ground because this harbor just went empty. So we are going to get one." Mello watched the first wave surge into the harbor, tearing apart the slips and sending boats careening into each other. Between the first and second surges, uh, I know it's, it, at least five or six boats sunk. It was just, it's just like a river racing through. All the docks were broke, the wires were in the water, and I'm going, ooh, this is good. <laughs> Mello had a choice, risk his life and save his boat, or watch it be destroyed. He decided to make a run for it. I waited for the water and I said, well, this is the one I got to go out on. In this video, captured by a local reporter, Mello struggles against the surge, fighting his way to the safety of open water. And then, the, well, of course, the Coast Guard, everybody was flying around. But I didn't even have time to turn the radios on, so I don't know what they were. I guess they were hollering at me. This little boat here has got 325 horsepower in it. And uh, I was using every bit of them, I'll tell you. Crescent City is no stranger to tsunamis. Coastal geography and the shape of the ocean floor combine to make the town a tsunami magnet. An underwater ridge called the Mendocino Fracture Zone extends from Asia almost directly to Crescent City, concentrating energy of tsunamis. To make matters worse, the city juts out from the coastline, exposing it to waves from all directions. The city has been hit by 31 tsunamis since the 1930s. Most caused little or no damage, but the worst of them, in 1964, wiped out the harbor and destroyed half the town. 11 people died. I had friends that were in the bars, because there used to be like three or four or five bars on Front Street, second, and they were all in there when the water would come. Ah, they just ordered another drink. And then the floor got wet, the stools start floating, and ah, <laughs> a lot of them survived. You know, they were in the bars, and, but we had no warning. The city rebuilt after 64, adding a massive jetty to shelter the harbor. When the Honshu earthquake struck off the coast of Japan, it sent waves racing across the Pacific at 500 miles an hour. The jetty deflected much of the force, but the narrow mouth and square shape of the harbor magnified the impact, trapping the energy like an oversized bathtub. As the tsunami currents came through the harbor, they swirled around, and so the currents were stronger around the edges of the harbor than they were in the center. And that's how come we ended up with a big pile of sunk boats. 
Harbor master Richard Young is anxious to rebuild, but cleanup and red tape alone could take months. In the meantime, the harbor is barely functioning. The harbor district's financial future really is in serious doubt at this time. How we survive this isn't clear to me today. The tsunami crippled the boats in the harbor, but they were only a fraction of the fleet. In fact, the majority are still fishing. The real victim of the tsunami is Crescent City, a town that depends on its harbor for survival. The potential losses to the harbor and to the city is what needs to be addressed. You know, there's a lot of transient vessels through the summer that won't come here now. And um, there's also fishermen from other ports and other states that would come to Crescent City a lot of times to go crab fishing. They're, they probably won't come. With many Crescent City fishermen unloading at other harbors, Mayor Charles Slurt, an architect, is worried about the town's economy. And when you understand we're a community of 4,000 people, um, if the harbor sneezes, the city coughs, and the county shivers, we're all interrelated. There's no fish processing. There's no moorings to tie up to. So those fishermen that would get their fuel or their clothing or meals they're not going to be able to do that, so that affects every business throughout town. Come up on your uh, closer, just a, just a buzz. Recovery began immediately. Hold that. First, the boats and wreckage were cleared. Swing left. Now the harbor must be dredged. Only then can the docks and slips be rebuilt. In late March, President Obama approved millions in FEMA funds, but the process will take several months. Throughout this process, environmental regulators are making sure oil and chemicals are contained. Thirty years ago, Crescent City had a thriving lumber industry. Now, those jobs are gone, and the town depends heavily on fishing revenue. Delnark County has been devastated. I mean, it's we had 47 mills in this town when I was growing up. 47. We don't have one now. Our problem is there's no future for it to get any young people to come work because you can't offer them anything unless they're born into it or their dad or uncle has a boat. And we, we've we really been struggling with getting a workforce. Hit hard by the recession, the town is struggling with the 13% unemployment rate. On top of this, fishing yields are low. When we're a fragile community, in a fragile economy. Uh, this year, I think the report was they brought out 300,000 pounds of Dungeness crab compared to 11 million pounds two years ago. So the fishing industry has hit very hard this year. Now on top of that, Mother Nature has hit us. Mello is hopeful that the coming salmon season, the first in three years, will help buoy the industry in the town. Whiz, what you better, don't, don't, don't jump out now, too. Oh, yeah. Hey, that's good. Whiz. Huh? You know, you want to get angry at somebody, and there really isn't anybody to get angry about. It's just Mother Nature and, and uh, what happens. We're a tough community, and we'll, we'll come back, but we're really at the edge. For gay and lesbian seniors who came out when being gay wasn't socially acceptable, moving into long-term care can mean going back into the closet and into a world where many caretakers are insensitive to their needs. Some, like 78-year-old Bob McDonald, chose to fly under the radar and seek human connection elsewhere. At 78 years old, Bob McDonald has outlived all his family. When Bob had a seizure almost two years ago, his doctor sent him to live in a senior home. Reluctantly, he packed up his art, his collection of classical music, his books, and moved into a double at Berkeley Pines. He was disheartened. And I look at places and I think, I can't really be serious about moving into a place like this where everybody is so dreary looking. It's not just the transition of moving into a nursing home that makes Bob feel isolated. 
He is also gay. I don't know that I'd, you know, stand up here and say, hey, everybody, I'm gay. I think the people here would, um, an awful lot of them would, would uh, say, uh, it, what, what's that mean? <laughs> the only place Bob felt he could be himself was in the art world. He wrote art reviews and was the director of museums. He met his first love there. Bob came of age in the late 1950s. It was a time when he couldn't talk about his sexuality. He remembers the first time he was introduced to what he calls the gay life. I was, I was cruised and picked up by a guy who was on campus near the camp in Ely. And I was, you know, astonished. Dan Ashbrook, who works with gay seniors, says people don't realize how difficult it was for them to be open. You could be arrested, beaten, institutionalized, um, that typically your society, your community, your family, again, your employers, they did not, they were not accepting of gays and lesbians and especially transgender people. In, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, homosexuality is one of the sins that cries to heaven for revenge, which is very, I, I love the vocabulary that is used. And um, it couldn't be stronger. And it couldn't be meaner. Many in Bob's generation are now entering nursing homes. While 13% of the population are seniors, advocates estimate that about 10% of them are gay and lesbian. And in senior homes, they can become invisible. There's no national health data. Uh, this population's traditionally been overlooked in any major research on health and aging. And without this information, it's difficult to fund LGBT programs. Even in California, which is the only state in the country that requires nurses to be trained to address the special needs of gay seniors. Some nonprofits, like Lavender Seniors, are stepping in. See, when we train, we survey the staff at agencies, and then we, do, then we collect all the data, and then we base our training based on the staff surveys. On a recent Thursday, a room full of nurses and hospital staff got tips on how to make this group feel welcome. And this is the number one issue. Don't assume heterosexuality, even when you know the client is married or has children and grandchildren, because there are many, many older adults who are in the closet. So Paula Pilecki runs Spectrum, which educates healthcare providers on gay and lesbian issues. I can tell this story myself, going into a doctor's office, and the first question I get is, you know, what's your husband's name? Her name is Marion, thank you. <laughs> gay elders are especially prone to loneliness, which can lead to depression or suicide. So Lavender Seniors pairs volunteers with people like Bob. Three years ago, volunteer River Lebo was sent over to visit Bob, and they hit it off. Sometimes they like to talk about old flings. <laughs> okay. So what's going on with you, kiddo? He can be really fun and, you know, kind of crazy in a way. And, you know, you could be in a bad mood and then you go out for lunch with him and you feel better. <laughs> but Bob's health has been worsening. For nearly two weeks, he hasn't left his bed. You're not totally alone. River's visit makes Bob feel he's cared for. In a way, we've gotten closer because he's really dependent on other people to provide some emotional and just friendly connection because there's nobody to talk to in the nursing home uh, since he's such an intellectual of, of sorts. And for somebody who likes to go out, having friends who he can call on is crucial for him to carry on. Without Lavender Seniors, I would be really isolated. It's this kind of human contact that advocates hope nursing homes will provide to the next generation of elderly gay people. In February, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill that would eliminate federal funding for Planned Parenthood and other sexual and reproductive health care providers. 
As the nation awaits a final vote from the Senate, some fear that a war on women's rights is being waged. Amendment number 11, printed in the congressional record offered by Mr. Pence of Indiana. The amendment that I bring to the floor tonight would deny any and all funding to Planned Parenthood Federation of America and its affiliates for the rest of the fiscal year. On February 18th, the House of Representatives passed the Pence Amendment to end over $300 million of federal funding for Planned Parenthood. In the hours leading up to the vote, the issue stirred heated debate on the House floor. There is nothing whatsoever benign or caring or generous or just or compassionate or nurturing about abortion. There is a vendetta against Planned Parenthood, and it was played out in this room tonight. Planned Parenthood has a right to operate. Planned Parenthood has a right to provide services for family planning. Planned Parenthood has a right to offer abortions. With passage in the House, the Pence Amendment and the fate of Planned Parenthood's funding went to the Senate. It would be several weeks before a final decision would be reached. Those who could lose the most are women like Erica Thomas, a 19-year-old UC Berkeley student who uses Planned Parenthood as her primary care provider. I first started going to Planned Parenthood when I was 13. I've gotten tested for all types of STDs. I've had HIV testing. They've done breast exams to make sure that I don't, I'm not showing signs of getting breast cancer. Um, I've gotten pap smears. Those are the kinds of services that California Congresswoman Jackie Speer says are critical for women. It's for women who are employed but have no health insurance. It's for women who are unemployed. It's for a college and high school women. It's for that universe of women that really runs the gamut. As an uninsured student, Erica is part of this universe of women who benefit most from Planned Parenthood's affordable health care. My mother's actually been unemployed for several years now. It's been, it's been a tough like three or four years for our family. And um, she's a single mom with two kids. My sister just graduated college and we really don't have money for health insurance. The primary argument against funding Planned Parenthood is the organization's support of abortion services. See, if, if Planned Parenthood was not killing babies, then we, we would support Planned Parenthood. Ron Kanapaski is a volunteer with the 40 Days for Life campaign. For Lent this year, he prayed outside of a Planned Parenthood clinic and spoke with women about the dangers of abortion. What choice means is abortion. So it really isn't a choice at all. It's just an abortion. And the choice is just kind of a, a, a smooth word to cover it over. And so that's, that's why we're opposing the funding of Planned Parenthood. But Planned Parenthood says that patients and private donations, not federal funding, pay for all abortion-related services. And that's because in 1976, Congress passed an amendment that outlaws the use of federal funding for abortion. Lupe Rodriguez is the director of public affairs for Planned Parenthood Marmonte, based in San Jose, which is the largest Planned Parenthood affiliate in the United States. Planned Parenthood Marmonte and all of our affiliates, um, for that matter, are audited every year um, to ensure that this accounting is being done correctly. And so um, any, any kind of um, uh, assertion otherwise is, is incorrect and can be proven by the records. And they claim that they're not using the money for abortions, but we know that, in fact, it does contribute to abortions whether they segregate the money or not. As the debate raged on, women across the country rallied against the Pence Amendment calling it an attack on women's rights. There's change we can believe in and change we just won't tolerate. And going back to the bad old days when women couldn't even get birth control is change we will never allow. I think what we've done is we've awakened a, a sleeping princess, not a sleeping giant, but a, a sleeping princess because I think up until now, women have either been ashamed or afraid to talk about it. And I think now there's growing recognition. This growing recognition caused contributions to Planned Parenthood to shoot up 500 percent online and in smaller amounts on the street. When I heard about the ruling happening with the House on February 18th, where all of Planned Parenthood's funding, federal funding, would be cut, um, I felt like something needed to happen. I was infuriated. I was totally incensed. We are having a reproductive health crisis in this country. 
and we need to do everything that we can to prevent it from, from being a disaster. Congress finally passed a budget on April 8th, but only by delaying a vote on the Pence Amendment. At the end of the day, this was a debate about spending cuts, not social issues like women's health. The following week, Congress voted separately to continue Planned Parenthood's funding. And with the vote divided pretty evenly along party lines, the debate continues. You know, we'll just have to stick to the, to the, to the game until it's over with, and uh, we end up with a victory on this thing and, uh, and stop all the killing of the babies. That's the, the main thing. You know, a lot of people have said that this is a war against women. And I don't like to use the term war, but I do think it is a frontal attack on women's rights in this country. As long as we can, we will continue to uh, move forward with providing the best health care and, and really increasing access for families and, and women and families that don't have access to health care right now. As the 2012 election season gears up, some believe the Pence Amendment has set the stage to make abortion a key campaign issue. But for women like Erica Thomas, there's a great deal at stake. I need Planned Parenthood there for me. Otherwise, I won't be able to have any of the access to the health care that they give me now. Water is one of California's most precious and unpredictable natural resources. Until now, state water managers have had to rely on rough estimates of how much water runs off the mountains each year. But University of California scientists have developed a new system of remote snow measurement, which may allow for greater accuracy than ever before. For decades, California has struggled to supply water to its more than 36 million users in the Golden State. To get an idea for how much water is flowing down from mountain rivers and streams each spring, officials have traditionally relied on estimates, averages of snowfall and river volume. Until now. This is University Bronco. Bronco Kirkes is a civil engineer at UC Berkeley. He's one uh, among several who are testing new ways to predict water supplies based on the winter's snowpack. Do you know which one's which? Uh, both the same size. Okay. So uh, the current idea is that since snow is one of the primary sources of water, um, more than half, um, we're looking for methods to determine the output of this snowpack uh, throughout the years. For the past three years, researchers have been monitoring this 1.5 square kilometer site in the Kings River Experimental Watershed, located an hour east of Fresno in the Sierra National Forest. The biggest problem hasn't been in recording the data, but in getting to the data once it's recorded. It can take up to two hours to reach the site and requires hiking in on snowshoes through as much as 10 to 12 feet of snow. Maybe we can get a shot of like you carrying me or something. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> but an innovative technology is changing that. Uh, up until now, everything had to be wired. So you couldn't have sensors, let's say, hundreds of meters apart because you're not going to run hundreds of meters of cable. Dr. Stephen Glazer specializes in wireless technology. And wireless has never before been used to measure snow depth. Now the, uh, the scientists and the water users have like untold amounts of data and detailed set of data. Um, and that's only possible through the use of our wireless network. Using instruments mounted on 10-foot poles, the sensors measure variables such as snow depth, air temperature, solar radiation, humidity, and soil absorption. Once transmitted to the site base station, the information is available within 15 minutes. This data could immediately help the state manage the 65 percent of California's usable water that comes from the Sierra snowmelt each year. Once diverted by canals and aqueducts throughout the state, it serves more than two-thirds of California water consumers. But those users are never quite sure just how much water will be available. And that's where Kirkes and Glazer's research comes in. The farmer has to uh, make plans for how many crops he's going to plant, he or she's going to plant that particular year. So if you underestimate the amount of water that, be, uh, that will be available, you're effectively growing fewer crops. And so what you'd like to do is provide much better predictions in order for people to allocate these resources in a more optimal fashion. After reporting on California farm policy for more than 30 years, Len Richardson is intimately aware of agriculture's dependence on reliable water management. Without water, we don't farm. That's basically the answer. With more accurate data on hand, farmers can make better decisions about their livestock and the crops that they plant. If farmers 
and all water users had real-time information, then it would be easier for everyone to manage. The application that we foresee is giving the uh, water manager some real-time information about how much water is going to come down the streams. This would allow state agencies to maximize the amount of energy that hydroelectric dams are capable of generating. But for now, the research is still in its early stages. They will develop another site on the middle fork of the American River this summer. And wireless networks really haven't been field proven um, in these conditions, and that's what we're working on. So we're using this new technology, but it's also partly research because it's being deployed in these very harsh environments. Kirkes says developing this technology could become his life's work. He envisions decades spent building the infrastructure and analyzing the wireless collection of data on snowmelt. Ten feet of what? We're just beginning to scratch the surface of how we can use this tremendous amount of new data that we're collecting in order to make water resource decisions. For now, Governor Jerry Brown has declared that the state's three-year drought is over. But as climate change seems poised to make California's weather more and more extreme, being able to precisely predict water supplies may be a resource greater than gold.